everybody. It is Monday morning, October the 21st, and time once again for the mailbag. Welcome back to SFF 180. Thomas here, your host. As always, I'm so glad you joined me, and we have a really good haul this episode, uh, because, as you'll remember, last week was a skip week, because I have been preparing for the 12 days of Halloween, which have now begun. Very first review was last night, so I hope you didn't miss that. If you're here for the Halloween festivities, fun times are here. So, uh, yeah, I'm really, really excited. But, um, yeah, missed the mailbag last week. The one from the week before was a really good one, even though it was short because there wasn't a whole lot in it. And the shorter mailbags tend to be a lot less popular. Um, like the previous mailbag has gotten really low views compared to the usual amount of views. But, uh, you know, if you missed it, if you skipped it because you thought, ah, it's short, there's probably not going to be anything in it. You shouldn't have because there were a lot of really good books in it. Not as much as a big mailbag, but what was there was fantastic. So if you missed that one, go check that one out. But we have a large haul this time because of the skip week. And um, without any further ado, let's just get right into it, shall we? And there's a bunch of random penguin stuff this time. So, uh, yeah, starting with this big old thing. All right, well, this is an unusual one to start out with. Uh, this is a YA from Random Penguin. It's by Kirsten White, uh, who wrote all those And I Darken books, which were like, they weren't really YA fantasy. They were more like YA historicals or alternate histories, as were. Uh, but this is uh, the first book in something called the Camelot Rising Trilogy. It comes out November the 5th. It's called The Guinevere Deception, and uh, it's described as a diverse and feminist reimagining of the Arthurian legend. All right. Uh, let's see. Princess Guinevere has arrived in Camelot to wed a stranger, the charismatic King Arthur. With magic clawing at the kingdom's borders, the great wizard Merlin conjured a solution. Send in Guinevere to be Arthur's wife and his protector from those who want to see the young king's idyllic city fail. Uh, the catch, Guinevere's real name and her true identity, is a secret. She is a changeling, a girl who has given up everything to protect Camelot. Okay, well, that's a twist on the thing. In order to keep Arthur safe, Guinevere must navigate a court in which the old, including Arthur's own family, demand that things continue as they have been, and the new, those drawn by the dream of Camelot, fight for a better way to live. As always, in the green hearts of forests and the black depths of lakes, magic lies in wait to reclaim the land. Arthur's knights believe they are strong enough to face any threat, but Guinevere knows it will take more than swords to keep Camelot free. Deadly jousts, duplicitous knights, and forbidden romances are nothing compared to the greatest threat of all, the girl with the long black hair riding on horseback through the dark woods towards Arthur. Because when your whole existence is a lie, how can you trust even yourself? Okay, and uh, I guess those of you who read the anti darken books and other things by Kirsten White will probably have a pretty good idea of what to expect from this. Uh, but this is uh, available, as I said, on November the 5th from uh, Random House Children's Books. And this next one is a very heavy package from Random Penguin. And this is a book in the Crown imprint. And it's The True Bastards, which is the sequel to The Grey Bastards, which came out last year. Actually, I think it came out a little before that, because The Grey Bastards is one of those self-published books, makes good kind of success stories. And uh, so after being self-published, uh, Crown Books uh, picked it up. Uh, it's by Jonathan French. And now there's a sequel, The True Bastards. And uh, let's see, and I believe it's all about, yeah, it's about a bunch of, it's about a sworn brotherhood of half-orcs who work in the desolate lotlands to protect human civilization from full orcs. Okay. No word on what, like, the three-quarter orcs think of all this. Uh, but it says it has more bloody action, sardonic humor, and clever plotting, and a new leader in charge. And this came out on October the 8th. I don't really want to read much more about it because I don't want to, uh, you know, reveal spoilers. But if you enjoyed the first one, then the new one is here for you right now. The True Bastards by Jonathan French. Okay, next up, I have three of these white packages. These are usually Macmillan titles, either Tor or somebody else. So let's have a look. And this is an arc that has so many blurbs on the cover that they just couldn't even fit the title on the arc. Uh, but it is for a book called The Unspoken Name. Uh, the author is A.K. Larkwood. And uh, it says, uh, Welcome to your new fantasy obsession. A great many books say that, of course. Uh, but this is described as the queer epic fantasy everyone is already raving about, apparently. Um, and it comes out uh, February the 11th from Tor Books. 
And uh, it goes like this. Uh, a name I can't pronounce. C-S-O-R-W-E. Sorry? Sorry. I'm going to go with Sorry. Is the protagonist epic fantasy has been waiting for. An orc priestess become wizard's enforcer. When she rescues a powerful sorceress from a terrible fate, Sori pits herself against the gods themselves. The unspoken name, rich, thoughtful, and unapologetically queer fantasy debut. All right, then. And, uh, yeah, like I said, it's just got a whole lot of um, pull quotes on the cover, uh, so they're really pushing this one, it would appear. Um, right, well, then. Uh, I guess we'll see in February of 2020. And next up, from Tor, here's one I'm quite happy to see. This is Interference by Sue Burke. Uh, this is the sequel to her book Semiosis, uh, which came out last year, and a very, very highly acclaimed science fiction debut, all about plants. And uh, Interference uh, comes out on the 22nd, so tomorrow, uh, in hardcover, and it's a duology. So, you know, Semiosis and Interference, and you have them all. And what can I say? Well, I don't want to say much. Again, spoilers, obviously. But it just says, uh, Sue, Burke Sue Burke returns to the fascinating world of Pax over 200 years after the first colonists landed there. A new set of explorers arrives from Earth on what they claim is a temporary scientific mission. But the Earthlings misunderstand the nature of the Pax settlement and its real leader. Even as Stevland attempts to protect his human tools, a more insidious enemy than the Earthlings makes itself known. Stevland is not the apex species on Pax. Well, there you go. So Interference is here tomorrow from Tor Books. And the third of those White Macmillan envelopes is this right here. It is Ninth House by Lee Bardugo. And this came out week before last. Okay, so it's been out for a couple of weeks. I'm, it's probably already well on the bestseller lists, I'm sure. Uh, this is, of course, now Lee Bardugo being a very, very famous, very, very popular YA author. Uh, and this is her first novel for adult readers. And it's interesting. I wasn't really prioritizing this before. I mean, uh, I was always thinking, okay, well, I mean, I'm sure I'll read it and review it because it's going to be a major release. And, you know, it sort of comes with the job. I don't mind that. Um, but I wasn't prioritizing it. And then I saw some people on book Twitter which is where I guess some people go to <laughs> have little meltdowns, completely freaking out about uh, the content of this book, which is reportedly uh, extremely violent and harsh at times. And I guess this caught some people off guard. And so they were having real, you know, the, the, the indignant responses to that. And then people were responding to them saying, hello, what part of this is Lee Bardugo's first novel for adults did you miss? You know, and it went on like that. And yeah, I kind of enjoyed seeing that back and forth for a little bit. But but <laughs> the revelations about the content and the controversy about the content is actually what piqued my interest more because <laughs> because I'm just that way, I suppose. Uh, but anyway, what can I say? It says um, mesmerizing adult debut from Lee Bardugo, a tale of power, privilege, dark magic and murder set among the Ivy League elite. OK, so I guess it's kind of like a skull and bone story with magic, perhaps. Uh, Galaxy Alex Stern is the most unlikely member of Yale's freshman class. Raised in the Los Angeles hinterlands by a hippie mom, Alex dropped out of school early and into a world of shady drug dealer boyfriends, dead-end jobs, and much, much worse. Hmm. In fact, by age 20, she is the sole survivor of a horrific unsolved multiple homicide. Maybe that's the scene that has freaked everyone out. Uh, some might say she's thrown her life away, but at her hospital bed, Alex is offered a second chance to attend one of the world's most prestigious universities on a full ride. What's the catch, and why her? Uh, still searching for answers, Alex arrives in New Haven, tasked by her mysterious benefactors, with monitoring the activities of Yale's secret societies. Okay, here we go. Uh, their eight windowless tombs are the well-known haunts of the rich and powerful, from high-ranking politicos to Wall Street's biggest players. But their occult activities are more sinister and more extraordinary than any paranoid imagination might conceive. Uh, they tamper with forbidden magic, they raise the dead, and sometimes they prey on the living. Okay, then. Well, uh, yeah, um, you have my attention. Hopefully this is every bit as grim and dark and violent as nasty as they're saying. But uh, Lee Bardigo's Ninth House is available now. Okay, moving on, I have a thin little package here from Tachyon, a small press imprint. Okay, well, this is a pleasant surprise to see. This is the arc for a new novella 
by Nancy Cress. All right. It's called Sea Change, and it comes out April the 24th, 2020. Interesting. Uh, it goes like this. Renata Black is entertained by the traffic snarl caused by a self-driving house until she spots the org's Tiffany Teal paint marking the house's windowsill. In 2022, GMOs were banned after a biofarmed drug called the Catastrophe. Worldwide economic collapse, agricultural standstill, and personal tragedy for a lawyer and her son. Ten years later, Renata, a.k.a. Carolyn Denton, is an operative of the org, an underground group that could save the world from itself. Their illegal research is performed and protected by splinter cells, which are in turn hunted by the feds. Now a mole is in the org, Renata is the only one who can find out who it is, and for answers, she will need to go to her clients living on the uh, Canalt Reservation. Uh, Nancy Cress once again delivers a smart, mesmerizing bio-thriller. A hard, nuanced look at the perils and promise of biological science. All right. Interesting. Sea change. And it's coming out from Tachyon Press in April. Okay, next on the stack we have a package from Bloomsbury. All right, this could be could be anything. I'm betting it's going to be a YA, though. Let's see. I was wrong in that guess. Uh, this appears to be an arc for an upcoming adult fantasy novel. Uh, it's coming out in, uh, in February, February the 18th, 2020. And it is for a book called The Lost Future of Pepper Harrow by Natasha Pulley. Uh, about, uh, let's see, from the pages of the acclaimed The Watchmaker of Filigree Street. All right. Thaniel Steepleton, an unassuming translator, and Kieta Mori, a watchmaker who remembers the future, are reunited. Uh, is this the sequel then to an I, I guess so. Um, yeah. All right. It's I guess it's the sequel to The Watchmaker Filigree Street, uh, with which I'm unfamiliar. So I will have to request that one. Um, 1888 Japan. Nationalism is on the rise and ghosts roam the streets. Daniel has received an unexpected posting to the British legation in Tokyo, and Mori has business that is taking him to Yokohama. Thaniel's brief is odd. The legation staff have been seeing ghosts, and Thaniel's first task is to find out what's really going on. Uh, but while staying with Mori at his family home, he starts to experience ghostly happenings himself. For reasons Mori won't or can't share, he is frightened, and then he vanishes. Hmm. Meanwhile, something strange is happening in a frozen labor camp in northern Japan. Takiko Pepperharrow, an old friend of Mori's, must investigate as the weather turns bizarrely electrical and ghosts haunt the country from Tokyo to Aokigahara Forest. Thaniel grows convinced that it all has something to do with Mori's disappearance and that Mori may be uh, in serious danger. This is this looks really nice. Um. You know, the setting and everything. Uh, so The Lost Future of Pepper Harrow uh, arrives February the 18th uh, from Bloomsbury. And I guess, as I said, I'm going to have to request, you know, the, uh, the previous book. All right, you guys, moving on down the list. Uh, here's a new package from World Weaver Press. Uh, this is a small press that I quite like. I've reviewed at least one of their books. And uh, everything they've gotten so far that they've sent me has, um, has looked interesting. And this is the arc for a book called Glass and Gardens, Solar Punk Winters. And uh, this would appear to be part of a series that they have done, uh, because I recall having gotten some previous uh, solar punk um, anthologies from World Weaver Press. Uh, this is optimistic science fiction, I guess flying in the face of all our fears of climate change and what have you. Uh, this anthology envisions winters of the future with stories of scientists working together to protect narwhals from an oil spill, to bring snow back to the mountains of Maine, to preserve ecosystems even if they have to be under glass domes. They're stories of regular people rising to extraordinary circumstances to survive extreme winter weather, to fix a threat to their community's energy source, to save a living city from a deep-rooted sickness. Some take place after an environmental catastrophe, with luxury resorts and military bases and mafia strongholds transformed into sustainable communes. Others rethink the way we could organize cities, using sky bridges and sea scrapers and constructed islands to adapt to the changes of the Anthropocene. Even when the nights are long, the future is bright in these 17 diverse tales. Well, there you go. And uh, this is available January the 7th. And uh, let's see, some of the authors, most of these are small press authors and folks whose names I'm not really familiar with, but that's good. That means new discoveries, right? Wendy Nickel is a name I recognize. Uh, that's about it here. But um, yeah, Solar Punk Winters 
coming in January from World Weaver Press. Tiny Little Mass Market from Random Penguin. <laughs> and this is the finished copy in Mass Market paperback of Shield of the People by my buddy Marshall Ryan Maresca. This is the 383rd Meridane novel <laughs> in just a few short years. No, actually, it's um, this one is the second book in his subseries, The Meridane Elite, and this is a hope punk uh, fantasy novel, so that means it is all about lawful good heroes uh, being noble and true and, uh, you know, protecting the people, as it were, because, you know, that's that's like the, the revolutionary pushback against uh, Grimdark, right? Uh, so Shield of the People, I guess, is an October... Mass Market Paperback from Daw Books. And next, also from Random Penguin, is this arc from Ace Books. And this is a book called Burn Cycle. The author is Joel Dane. And uh, this is the second book. Uh, this is the sequel to a book called Cry Pilot. Uh, this is a book that almost made my stack for Space Opera September, but I had to pare it back because it was going to be too many books. Um, well, not this one, but I mean, Cry Pilot was. Uh, but now Burn Cycle uh, is coming in January, I believe. Yeah, a Cry Pilot uh, came out in August, so it's uh, still a very recent release. Action-packed and powerful while also being full of heart and humor, Cry Pilot was praised for its authentic characters, wry one-liners, and brilliant depiction of the close-knit bonds and camaraderie that develop in a military unit. And so Burn Cycle uh, is going to be out on February the 4th. So just a very short uh, six-month uh, turnaround for the sequel on this one. Uh, Cry Pilot followed Maseo Ketu, a man with a criminal past who is seeking redemption. Ketu volunteers to be a Cry Pilot in a military suicide mission against a dangerous new threat. Assigned to a squad of misfits, Ketu learns how to fight and obey and to trust. And then I guess it all sort of goes on from there. So, you know, following uh, Maseo Ketu's story. Um, presumably he did not die as a suicide pilot in Cry Pilot. <laughs> Uh, so if you did read the first one, uh, if you read Cry Pilot, let me know what you thought in the comments. But um, Burn Cycle uh, in February from Ace Books. Oh, and this next one is not, not in a white envelope, but it is from Tor. Okay, well, this looks to be a new book from Tor Teen, actually, and it's something called The Good Luck Girls. The author is Charlotte Nicole Davis. And this looks to be maybe kind of a YA fantasy western sort of a thing, which is an idea I think is terrific. Really would love to see more fantasy westerns, but let's see, is there um is there a cell sheet? Did they? No, of course it's not. Okay, I'll read the flap. Uh, goes like this. The country of Arqueta calls them good luck girls. They know their luck is anything but. Sold to a welcome house as children and branded with cursed markings. Trapped in a life they would never have chosen. Okay, probably not very Western. Uh, when one of them accidentally kills a man... Okay, well, maybe it is kind of Western. Uh, five girls risk a dangerous escape and harrowing journey to find freedom, justice, and revenge in a country that wants them to have none of those things. Pursued by Arquetta's most vicious and powerful forces, both human and inhuman, their only hope lies in a bedtime story passed from one good luck girl to another. A story that only the youngest are most desperate would ever believe. It's going to take a lot more than luck for them all to survive. All right, well, I mean, there there are certainly Western trappings to that general premise, right? You know, all the, you know, we got to escape and the posse's after us and all that. But um, like the look and the sound of it, could be very exciting. Lots of chases. Uh, but the Good Luck Girls looks to be available now from Tortin in hardcover. And we're going to wrap up today's show with a couple of boxes. Um which could have God knows what in them. Uh, this one is the smaller one. It's from Blackstone Publishing. So let's see what we have, shall we? Okay, well, this definitely is a surprise. This is not the sort of thing I would expect to see from Blackstone Publishing. Uh, but, you know, there you go. Uh, this is the arc for a massive 650-page uh, epic fantasy uh, by an author named Justin T. Call. It's called Master of Sorrows. It's described as the first book in the Silent Gods series, and it is slated for release... What is it? Where'd it go? I just saw it. Oh, here it is. Other side. February the 25th. Uh, every Dark Lord has an origin. You've heard the story before. An orphaned boy, raised by a wise old man, comes to a fuller knowledge of his magic and uses it to fight the great evil threatening his world. But what if that hero were destined to become the new Dark Lord? Uh, the Academy of Sean Baloo has stood against magic for centuries. Hidden from the world, acting from the shadows, it trains its students to detect and retrieve magic artifacts, which it jealously guards from the misuse of others. 
Because magic is dangerous, something that heals can also harm, and a power that aids one person may destroy another. Of the Academy's many students, only the most skilled can become avatars, warrior thieves, capable of infiltrating the most heavily guarded vaults, and only the most determined can be trusted to resist the lure of magic. More than anything, Anev de Breath wants to become one of them. But Anev carries a secret. Unlike his classmates, who were stolen as infants from the capital city, Anev was born in the village of Shanbalu, was believed to be executed, and then unknowingly raised by his parents' killers. Seventeen years later, he struggles with the burdens of a forbidden magic, a forgotten heritage, and a secret deformity. When Anev is subsequently caught, between the warring ideologies of his priestly mentor and the Academy's masters, he must finally decide whether to accept the truth of who he really is, or embrace the darker truth of what he may one day become. Okay, well there you are. Inverting the Chosen One trope is not, you know, the most original concept in all of epic fantasy, but this one sounds like it could be very character-driven. And so, yeah, it's all in the telling, as they say, so this could be pretty interesting. Looks gorgeous. Very beautiful cover. Very attractive edition. Uh, but the book is called Master of Sorrows. It will be available February the 25th uh, by Justin T. Call from Blackstone Publishing. Let me know in the comments. And we are wrapping up this week with this very heavy box <laughs> from the uh, the poor beleaguered people at Tor.com Publishing, who I admit I've been a bit of a pest towards. Uh, getting it's you know time for a new care package, guys, and uh, they've had conventions and everything, and building and moving to a new building and all of that to deal with. But um, they finally got me a new care package. I appreciate that very much. Tor.com. So let's see what's in here because it's going to be a hell of a lot of stuff. Well, first of these, and my God, that is a full box. Uh, the first of these is the finished copy of a new novella, debut novella, called The Monster of Ellendhaven by Jennifer Geisbrecht. And I do believe that this is available right now. I did get this as an ARC because they packaged the ARC for this one in the same box that they sent the ARC for Gideon the Ninth. Uh, it says, this is a darkly compelling fantasy of revenge. A tale about murder, a monster, and the sorcerer who loves both. The city of Ellendhaven sulks on the edge of the ocean. Racked by plague, abandoned by the south, stripped of industry, and left to die. Uh, but not everything dies so easily. A thing without a name stalks the city, a thing shaped like a man. With a dark heart and long pale fingers yearning to wrap around throats, a monster who cannot die. His frail master sends him out on errands, twisting him with magic, crafting a plan too cruel to name, while the monster's heart grows fonder and colder and more cunning. The sorcerer's work is subtle, changing minds and curdling hearts, with barely a trace left behind. But there are signs to read for magic hunters coming up from the capital in the south. These monsters of Allentaven will have their revenge on everyone who wronged the city, even if they have to burn the world to do it. Okay. Well, that sounds like exactly the opposite of Hope Punk. Um, but, uh, yeah, The Monsters of Ellendhaven. Very, very, very grimdark sounding fantasy uh, by Jennifer Geisbrecht. And it looks like there are quite a few finished copies in this stack. Here is one for Desdemona and the Deep, which I have already received from Tor.com as an ARC. Uh, the author here is C.S.E. Cooney. And so I guess now the book is out. And this one goes like this. A steep drop into an uncanny, richly painted underworld. Desdemona and the Deep tells the story of the spoiled daughter of a rich mining family who must retrieve the tithe of men her father promised to the world below. On the surface, her world is rife with industrial pollution that ruins the health of poor factory workers, while the idle rich indulge themselves in unheard of luxury. Below are goblins, mysterious kingdoms, and an entirely different hierarchy. Okay, then. So, we have class struggles in a dark fantasy world and demons in Desdemona and the Deep by C.S.E. Cooney. Next up, Sisters of the Vast Black, uh, which I have read because I got the arc for this. And, uh, well, I'll tell you about it when the review appears. It will be in November sometime. Uh, but this is by an author named Alina Rother, or Rather, and uh, it's nuns in space, basically. Uh, they lived at the very outer bounds of what was known. Years ago, Old Earth sent forth sisters and brothers into the vast dark of the prodigal colonies, armed with only crucifixes and iron faith. Now the sisters of the Order of St. Rita are on an interstellar mission of mercy aboard Our Lady of Impossible Constellations, a living, breathing ship that seems determined to develop a will of its own. When the Order receives a distress call from a newly formed colony, the sisters discover that the bodies and souls in their care and that of the galactic diaspora are in danger. 
and not from the void beyond, but from the nascent central governments and the church itself. So, Sisters of the Vast Black, New Space Opera by Lena Rather. This next one is Her Silhouette Drawn in Water. Uh, the author is uh, Vilar Kaftan, and again, they've already sent me this one as an arc as well, so nice to have the finished version. Uh, this one goes this way. Uh, all B has ever known is darkness. She doesn't remember the crime she committed that landed her in the cold, twisting caverns of the prison planet Kolel Cab, with only fellow prisoner Chella for company. Chella says that they're telepaths and mass murderers, that they belong here, too dangerous to ever be free. B has no reason to doubt her until she hears the voice of another telepath, one who has answers and can open her eyes to an entirely different truth. Hmm, that sounds interesting. Her silhouette drawn in water by Viler Kaftan. Now, this next one is an arc, and it is for a book called Finna. Uh, the author is Nino Cipri, and this comes out in February, I believe. February the 25th, is that correct? Yes, February the 25th. And uh, let's see how this one goes. Uh, Finna is a rambunctious, touching story that blends all the horrors the multiverse has to offer with the everyday awf awfulness of low-wage work. Okay. It explores queer relationships and queer feelings, capitalism and accountability, labor and love all with a bouncing sense of humor and a commitment to the strange. Okay, satire then. Uh, when an elderly customer at a big box furniture store slips through a portal to another dimension, it's up to two minimum wage employees to track her across the multiverse and protect their company's bottom line. Multidimensional swashbuckling would be hard enough, but those two unfortunate souls broke up a week ago. To find the missing granny, Ava and Jules will brave carnivorous furniture, swarms of identical furniture spokespeople, and the deep resentment simmering between them. Can friendship blossom from the ashes of their relationship? In infinite dimensions, all things are possible. Okay, so funny little satire about uh, consumerism and capitalism uh, <laughs> across multiverses. Sounds like it could be really cute, but it's Finna. The author is Nino Cipri on February the 25th. Now, here's one that I've been looking forward to. This is The Killing Light, and this is the third volume in Mike Cole's uh, series that started with The Armored Saint, which I have read, have not yet reviewed. It is... Uh, if you're a fan of, like, the Red Sister books, absolutely. Uh, but The Killing Light is available this month. It may be out already, or maybe coming out this week uh, from Tor.com. But let's see, is there anything that I can say? The Sacred Throne Trilogy, so this is it. So you should get all three of them and not, not screw around. Uh, but says, yeah, Cole has created a dark medieval world that by the end has only a small sliver of light in it. The spunky Heloise fights for her family and friends and makes it easy to cheer her on through her adventures. Uh, must read for fans of Erica Johansson's Queen of the Tearling series. Okay, I suppose. I haven't read those myself. Probably be a good fit if they say so. That's a quote from Booklist. But The Killing Light, uh, now available from Tor.com Publishing. And next we have Come Tumbling Down, the arc for Shauna McGuire's fifth Wayward Children book. And this comes out in January. And having given a, a glance over the back here, I can tell you I can't really read uh, the uh, synopsis for this one because it does spoil one of the earlier books. Uh, but, uh, but it is a story about uh, Jack, of Jack and Jill, and I'll just leave it at that. Uh, but Come Tumbling Down will be out in January, so I guess you can see the further adventures of those characters. And next, this is one that I have been very, very excited for. Uh, this is a book called Riot Baby. The author is Tochi Onyabuchi, uh, who has uh, mostly uh, written some YA uh, adventures up to now, but I've been excited to read those because they seem really cool. Uh, but Riot Baby comes out in January, it says... And it's described as an epic ode to the future and past, uh, says Daniel Jose Older. Uh, tiny acts of resistance, love, and the wild, unstoppable sweep of revolution. Rooted in foundational loss and the hope that can live in anger, Riot Baby is both a global dystopian narrative and an intimate family story with quietly devastating things to say about love, fury, and the black American experience. Ella and Kev are brother and sister, both gifted with extraordinary power. Their childhoods are defined and destroyed by structural racism and brutality. Their futures might alter the world. When Kev is incarcerated for the crime of being a young black man in America, Ella, through visits both mundane and supernatural, tries to show him the way to a revolution that could burn it all down. Okay, then. 
Uh, this is uh, going to be a book uh, that's uh, that will really kind of spark some discussion. But Riot Baby will be out in January by Tochi Onyabuchi. And we are almost to the bottom of this box, you guys. This next one is a little novella called Prosper's Demon. Uh, the author is K.J. Parker. Okay. And uh, let's see, this one will be out January the 28th. Looks really awesome on the front. Let's see what it's all about. It says, in a botched demonic extraction. They say the demon feels it ten times worse than the man, but they don't die, and we do. Equilibrium. The unnamed and morally questionable narrator is an exorcist with great follow-through and few doubts. His methods aren't delicate, but they're undeniably effective. He'll get the demon out, he just doesn't particularly care what happens to the person. Prosper of Shans is a man of science determined to raise the world's first philosopher king, reared according to the purest principles. Too bad, he's demonically possessed. All right, then. Uh, Prosper's Demon, available January the 28th by K.J. Parker. And finally, we have one that I have been very, very curious about ever since I heard it announced. Uh, this is a book called Docile, and it's the first novel by K.M. Spara, uh, an author whose work, you know, hasn't necessarily always communicated to me, but I have always uh, found uh, the work to be compelling and certainly challenging and thought-provoking, you know, regardless of whether or not I ended up, you know, liking it in the traditional sense. Uh, but this is available in March, I do believe. Yeah, it's March title. It goes like this. Docile is a science fiction parable about love and sex, wealth and debt, abuse and power, a challenging tour de force that it turns seduces and startles. Uh, to be a docile is to be kept, body and soul, for the uses of the owner of your contract. To be a docile is to forget, to disappear, to hide inside your body from the horrors of your surface. To be a docile is to sell yourself to pay your parents' debts and buy your children's future. And I guess it is making a, a very dark and possibly satirical commentary on how we are all, in a sense, wage slaves. And this makes the slaves part of that very, very literal indeed, perhaps. This sounds like it could be a premise uh, that would um, really attract, say, a filmmaker like Bong Joon-ho. Because right, I just saw Parasite recently, and uh, with uh, some of uh, Bong Joon-ho's earlier movies, this sounds like the sort of theme that he would be uh, you know, interested in pursuing as a filmmaker, because it sounds like that kind of a story about class and wealth and the haves versus, you know, the... <laughs> You, you, you're mine kind of a kind of a life. So interesting. I'm looking forward to reading this. But Docile will be available by KM Spara in March from Tor.com Publishing. And then they threw a few other goodies in the box as well, like some buttons and pins and a few other, like here's a flyer for Network Effect, which is the next uh, Murderbot book. It's going to be the first full-length Murderbot novel. Uh, that's happening uh, sometime next year. A uh, book called Repo Virtual, a new uh, book by Corey J. White. Um, Upright Women Wanted, a new novella by Sarah Gailey. Uh, so, you know, there's other forthcoming stuff from Tor.com, you know, that they're plugging in this box. So, yeah, really kind of cool and exciting times ahead. And there you have it, guys. Presumably that's the kind of big, honking mailbag you really love. But like I said, if you missed uh, the previous episode, go check it out. I think you'll really you'll like that one as well. But you know the drill. Light up those comments. Let me know which of these looks most interesting and most exciting to you, which you would like to see me prioritize for review. Otherwise, if you enjoyed watching, please hit that like button, share the video far and wide with all of your SFF reading friends, and above all, please subscribe. If you haven't done so, that is how the channel grows. You can also support the channel at my Tee Public store and at my Patreon. The recruits into Wink's Army get little perks like getting to see some of my videos early. I want to thank all of those fine folks for their additional support. It's incredibly helpful. I want to thank the rest of you for being the very best viewers in all of BookTube. So, I'll be joining you every night this week and for the next several days, next nine days or so, midnight Eastern for the Halloween reviews, 12 days of Halloween, right? And until I see all of you then, happy reading.